Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Would ask our in-house guests to make that last courtesy check that cell phones have been muted or turned off as we prepare to begin as a courtesy to our presenters. Our internet viewers, of course, are welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. We will, of course, post the program on the Heritage homepage for your future reference as well. Hosting our discussion today is Elizabeth Slattery, who is legal fellow in our Edwin Meese Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. Her research focuses on issues such as the rule of law, the First Amendment, civil rights and equal protection, and the scope of constitutional provisions. She also studies and writes about cases before the Supreme Court, judicial nominations, and the proper role of the courts. She manages the Mies Center's appellate advocacy programs. Her analysis appears in many newspapers, and she also can be followed on Twitter at E.H. Slattery, for those who would like to join her there. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Slattery. Elizabeth. Thank you, John. Yesterday, the Supreme Court heard a challenge to the requirement that government employees pay fees to the local union even if they choose not to join it. Rebecca Friedrichs and other public school teachers argue that forcing them to pay fees for the union's collective bargaining costs violates the First Amendment. Whether the union's negotiating for specific class sizes or pressing a local government to spend tax dollars on teacher pensions instead of building parks, the union's collective bargaining embodies political choices and some teachers do not want to be forced to support them. In the 1977 case Abood versus Detroit uh, Board of Education, the Supreme Court upheld these arrangements because the non-members supposedly benefit from collective bargaining agreements. In recent years, however, some of the justices have questioned the validity of this decision, pointing out that it imposes a significant impingement on employees' free speech and associational rights. So how do the arguments go at the court yesterday? Will the justices rule in favor of free speech? Our distinguished panel of speakers will address this and other issues. In order to get to hear what they have to say, I'll keep their introductions very brief. Rebecca Friedrichs has been an elementary school educator for 28 years. Since her career began, she's been concerned about the policies and politics of the teachers' union she is forced to financially support. Although she opted out of political uh, dues for the first 10 years of her career, she later joined the union in order to gain a voice. She served on her local union board for three years with hopes that union representatives would listen to common sense and reason in order to bring about positive change in her district and in the union's spending of its members' dues. Unable to make change happen from within the belly of the beast, in 2012, Rebecca began writing editorials to educate the public on the abuses occurring within teachers' unions, and she became the lead plaintiff in the case we are here to talk about today. Next, we'll hear from Michael Carvin, who is a partner at the law firm Jones Day, where he focuses on constitutional litigation, including the First Amendment and civil rights matters. He's argued numerous cases in the U.S. Supreme Court, including the recent challenge to the Affordable Care Act federal exchanges, a case involving a state's effort to criminalize truthiness in political campaigns, and yesterday he argued on behalf of Rebecca Friedrichs. Before entering private practice, Mike served in the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel and Civil Rights Division. He's a graduate of the George Washington University School of Law and Tulane University. Next, we'll hear from James Shirk, who is a research fellow in labor economics here at the Heritage Foundation. He researches ways to promote competition and mobility in the workforce rather than erect barriers that prevent workers from getting ahead. James has testified before several congressional committees as well as state legislatures across the country, and his commentary have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and many other outlets. He regularly appears on CNN, Fox News, and PBS to discuss labor issues. James has a Master of Arts in Economics from the University of Rochester and a bachelor's degree from Hillsdale College. And last but not least, we'll hear from Patrick Wright, who is the Vice President for Legal Affairs at the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. He's also the director of Mackinac's public interest law firm that represents individual freedom and the rule of law in Michigan. He previously served as a Michigan Supreme Court Commissioner, a post in which he made recommendations to the court about which appeals it should hear. He was also an Assistant Attorney General for the State of Michigan and a Policy Advisor for the Michigan Senate's Majority Policy Office. He is a graduate of the University of Michigan and George Washington University Law School. With that, I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here with us, for celebrating our case with us. 
Uh, since my attorney is here today to talk to you about the details of the case, I'm just going to share my personal journey with you. So my issues with the union started when I was a student teacher. I was about 22 years old and I was learning from this outstanding teacher and next door to us was a teacher who was, in my opinion, abusive to her students. Basically what I would see every day is she would grab them by the arm and yank them and scream at them and they were six years old. These were first graders. I was terrified and I could tell that they were terrified. So I talked to my master teacher, you know, what can we do about this horrible situation, thinking that someone was going to remove this woman or discipline her or something. And I was educated about teachers unions that day. My master teacher told me that because of teacher tenure, it was very difficult for school districts to rid themselves of teachers who were even abusive like this to children because she had teacher tenure, so she had a permanent job. Well, I was disgusted by that, and I couldn't support something like that. So I started my teaching career as an agency fee payer, which meant I didn't have to pay toward the political portion of the fees. But unfortunately, I was still covering the collective bargaining that was protecting her job. So. Um, about three years into my job, we had a voucher initiative in California. And we were trying to create school choice for parents. I believe in school choice. I want school choice for my kids and for my students. Well, every week when I would go into my mandatory teacher staff meetings, the union would come in and they would tell us how we needed to vote against vouchers, how they were going to destroy public education, how we were all going to lose our jobs if we did not destroy this voucher initiative, and how education was going to be so horrible for our students, they were all going to be abused in these other schools. It is um, something that the unions do well, and that is using fear tactics to frighten the public and to frighten especially teachers. So I went and did my homework. I'm an independently minded girl, and I started listening to some debates on the voucher initiative and I came out pro-voucher. So I went back to the next meeting where they were putting on all the pressure. Literally, they come right up to you with a paper, you need to sign this, you need to phone bank, you need to go door to door, whatever they want you to do. And I said, no, thank you. And um, I was confronted with, why, why not? You need to sign up, you need to save education. And I said, well, I've been doing my homework and I'm pro-voucher. I think my students and their parents should have a choice. And my, um, union rep wasn't very happy with me. Right there in front of all my colleagues, she called me a radical right winger. So I decided that day that if it's radical to do what's right for my students, I'll be radical every day of the week and call me anything they want. So um, a few years went by and I was still an agency fee payer and it suddenly dawned on me. I get a very small rebate being an agency fee payer I get no vote in collective bargaining, even though I pay 100% of collective bargaining as a fee payer. I get no vote, and I can't serve in union leadership. And I could tell that my, uh, you know, some of my friends in the union leadership were very, uh, they had common sense, they loved their students, so I thought, hey, I know, I'll become a full member, and I'll serve on the union board. Maybe I can make a difference from the inside. What was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> so I tried. I served as a union rep for a year for my campus and then two years on the union executive board. I went to union conferences. I was bullied there because I dared to ask, you know, my colleagues and I are uncomfortable with the things you're supporting. Couldn't we talk about this? And oh no, if you don't follow exactly what the unions want, they treat you, they didn't use this word, but they treat you like a bigot. There is something wrong with you if you don't believe everything they follow politically and within collective bargaining. There, do, there's just something wrong with you. Our way is the only way. So um, while I was a union uh, leader on the union board, the terrible um, hit to our economy came. So this is around 2008, 2009, the economy starts to tank. And we were told that we were going to lose several teachers. They were all going to lose their jobs, be pink slipped, laid off. Uh, because of lack of funding. So as a union board member, I thought, well, gee, let's do something to save these jobs. These teachers are great. Three of them I was mentoring personally, they had themselves brought up our fourth grade writing scores from dismal to outstanding. 
in one year. They deserved to keep their jobs. So I started fighting for them and I went to my colleagues and said, hey, what do you think? What if we took just a two to 3% pay cut to save these jobs? I teach in a low income community. A lot of my students' parents had lost their jobs. Many of them had hours cut back or pay cut back. So I said, this would be a great way to show solidarity with our community. The taxpayers in this community are hurting. Why should we be, you know, doing so fancily while they lose teachers and class sizes go up? Let's just take a little cut. You know, they wouldn't even talk to me about it. They said, absolutely not, Rebecca. The teachers won't go for it. So, of course, I countered. Teachers on my campus want to go for it. I've been speaking with them. I'm speaking for them today on their behalf. Isn't that what I do as a representative? And they came back with, sorry, we're just not going to do it. So you may have noticed I'm a little persistent. So I kept bothering them week after week. Couldn't we just take that pay cut? Couldn't we just send out a survey, an anonymous survey? No one would have to feel fear. Survey monkey, something. No, no, no was the answer I received every time. Finally, I annoyed our union leadership so much that one day one of them said to me, look, Rebecca, okay, you don't have to worry about those teachers. The union is going to take care of them. We are going to offer them a seminar to teach them how to get unemployment benefits. And I was, as you probably are, shocked. I said, look, we charge them $1,000 a year to be in this union, and you claim that you represent their best interests and their students' best interests. They always say they're best for the kids, right? And here you are. You're going to let them lose their jobs, and you're going to allow class sizes to go up. I don't understand. Of course, they had no answer, but of course, every one of those teachers was laid off. And the tragic part from my perspective as a teacher, besides how it impacted our students, is that most of those teachers, because I knew them well, came to me, or they'd be in the teacher's lounge just talking to everyone. Every one of them was demoralized. Every one of them thought they were not good teachers. What did I do wrong? What am I, what is it that, that I'm not good at? Or I mean, they literally felt like they had let the kids down. Exactly the opposite. They had done a fantastic job. They were team players. They brought up the test scores even. But they left feeling that they weren't any good. And some of them didn't go back into teaching in other districts. Some did. So it, it, you know, it was just shocking to me that I couldn't do what was best for my students and even my colleagues as a union representative. So that was one of, one of many straws that broke the camel's back for me. So I stepped down and I opted out again and became an agency fee payer again. Um, when I became an agency fee payer again, I started doing more research on what my unions were involved in, not only politically, but through collective bargaining. And it came to a point where I was quite frustrated because the American people were being told a very different story. The union has a very loud voice in the media. And they were telling the American people that they were doing great things for teachers. All teachers should have to pay. We're doing great things for them. Well, in my opinion, the union's um, representation or these great things that they're supposedly doing for us aren't worth the moral costs. It's immoral to do something that harms a child. And I couldn't stand for that anymore. Um, the pension issue in our country. They keep fighting for these great defined benefit pension plans for me at the expense of all of you, at the expense of our economy, at the expense of our country, at the expense of my students' future. That's immoral. So I got to the point where I thought, someone has to speak out. Someone has to help the, to educate the public on the truth here. And so I started writing editorials. I did not have one connection to media. I had no idea how I was going to get them published. My husband was just cheering me on, send it in. And my first one, of course, was rejected and I was devastated. But it connected me with all these great education reformers. And then the next one was published. 
And I was just so excited to, to just get my voice out there. But what I discovered was the only way, the only way to change this problem of union domination in our country was a lawsuit. So I was thrilled when I discovered that I could be a part of this lawsuit. When they chose me to be the lead plaintiff, I couldn't believe it. I had to pinch myself every single day. I'm still pinching myself every single day. What an honor to get to speak for so many public employees across this country who are in fear of the unions and who are devastated that they have to fund things with which they disagree. And what an honor to get to meet Mike Carvin and have him argue on my behalf. He was great. <laughs> he was great. I wish you all could have been there. Yes. So I, with that, I'm going to turn it over to him. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca's not bad either. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, she's been at really all the plaintiffs. And one of the, uh, I just want to pause before I discuss the argument. The difficulties of these high-profile public litigation is that the plaintiffs really do get a lot of scrutiny and a lot of criticism from people who are not exactly fair-minded, particularly in an emotional situation like this. And we really couldn't have asked for a better spokesman than uh, Rebecca. And really, all the other plaintiffs in this case have done a terrific job. So that's really actually a good place to begin, because the media tries to portray this as a uh, you know, fight to defund unions' political activity, but all it is is just sort of reaffirming what I think we all think is the basic constitutional and moral principle, which is that people are in charge of their own speech. They get to decide uh, which groups they want to support and uh, not to be compelled by the government to give a certain amount of money to the Republican National Committee, the NRA, or to a teacher's union, which is no different in uh, former structure than any other advocacy group. It's making very controversial proposals on very important public issues. And we were, we're not asking the court to resolve that educational reform debate. <clears throat> we're just asking the court to acknowledge that it exists and to make the obvious point that one side of the debate can't make the other side of the debate fund them. And uh, that's just contrary to every principle since the founding from Thomas Jefferson to James Madison. So. That was the backdrop for yesterday's case, where a case called the Boot it upheld this, uh, I thought, facially unconstitutional regime about 40 years ago. A subsequent decisions of the court had indicated, to put it mildly, skepticism about uh, a Boot's validity, and we brought this case. Um, I think the argument went well, and you know we certainly had an opportunity to present our, our side of the case. I've taken a blood oath because of prior experience that never even hinted a prediction on how, uh, <laughs> how a case is going to come out, particularly in light of argument. Um, uh, so I will just, A, a of course, I was brilliant, as Rebecca uh, <laughs> pointed out. The other side was less brilliant, but not because uh, they're worse lawyers or anything else, but because they really, if you think about it, they, they don't have a lot of arguments to make. Here's the substance of the other side's argument. A unique in American history and, and the Amer American society, we can compel people like Rebecca to support uh, a union uh, be because of its collective bargaining. Why? Because she's a so-called free rider. Putting aside the point that it's a little tough to free ride on a vehicle that you vehemently disagree with uh, and that you don't think all of the things the unions are doing is wonderful, <laughs> the basic point I'd like to make is, and as the court has repeatedly made, Calling somebody in a pejorative term like a free rider doesn't somehow authorize the government uh, to compel you to subsidize. What does that mean? It means the government has decided for the citizen that the citizen is benefited by this ideological advocacy group. And since the government has made that decision for the citizen, it's going to require the citizen to support the ideological advocacy group that the citizen doesn't think is so hot, but the government thinks is a good idea. I think just articulating that interest tells you why it's, it's bizarrely uh, uh, impermissible under the First Amendment, because the First Amendment, as Abood itself recognized, is premised on the notion that in this society, we, the citizens, are masters of our own speech. They can't compel, even they would admit, they couldn't compel Rebecca to speak in favor of the union, to speak in favor of collective bargaining. So why should they be able to require her to give her hard-earned money to subsidize speech with which he disagrees. It's the, it's the same principle. So the basic argument that was going on yesterday was um, 
it's universally acknowledged that free riding doesn't justify compelling subsidization in any other context, including, for example, when unions lobby. According to the other side, when unions go to Sacramento and get good pension benefits, uh, people like Rebecca are free riding on it, and therefore uh, they should be compelled to un uh, subsidize the union lobby. But even Abood supporters agree that goes way too far. You can't uh, subsidize um, union lobbying. So they've all been desperately struggling to say, okay, you can't subsidize union lobbying, but it's okay to subsidize uh, collective bargaining. But the point we made, and I think the point that probably Justice Kennedy articulated best yesterday was, if anything, you have less reason, the government has less justification for compelling subsidization in the collective bargaining context does it, than it does in the lobbying context. <coughs> The unions go to Sacramento, Rebecca can go up the next day and say whatever she wants to these state legislators about these important issues that she, uh, she talked about. She doesn't have that freedom in the collective bargaining context. The union decides they want this kind of protections for abusive teachers. They want, kind of, uh, they want seniority-based layoffs instead of merit-based layoffs or assignments. Uh, people who disagree with these issues that go to the heart of how you educate our children are forced, nonetheless, to abide by whatever the union wants. So the notion of calling people like that free riders when they've required you to free ride because they've deprived you of your own ability to go and make your argument to, <clears throat> to your employer is particularly weak. And that's why Justice Kennedy was saying, I think quite presciently yesterday, you keep calling them free riders, but what they really are is compelled riders. Mm -hmm. The union has reached out and conscripted these people and say, whatever deal we, the union, work out, you people are bound by. So they're compelled to ride, so how can you criticize them and how can you say that they are somehow entitled to or required to compensate the union for this wonderful service that they don't, that they don't think is so wonderful? And literally they had no answer uh, to that. Um, the, other, the rest of the argument was notable from my perspective in terms of what the other side couldn't say. Because the other justification is, um, okay, Maybe normally you can't require somebody to subsidize a group, but uh, the government has a really strong interest in just dealing with one exclusive representative. They don't want to have two people there making conflicting demands. And this is what Abood said. Then it said, therefore, agency fees are okay. And it's the therefore that makes no sense. Yeah, the, the, the government way, may well have an interest in having an exclusive representative, but what does that say about why they have an interest in making people like Rebecca give money to the exclusive representative? It doesn't make any sense. So people have hypothesized, well, look, if the agency fees lead to the demise of the exclusive representative, then the employer's got to deal with two representatives. So maybe if the lack of agency fees would uh, uh, drive the California Teachers Association out of business, maybe then they've got uh, an argument. And the fascinating thing, James Burnham is here, and he'll tell you, we've been literally taunting the district since the district court, to, uh, the union since the district court to say, um, do you really think you're going to go bankrupt without agency fees? And of course, they can't make that ridiculous assertion. Um, and uh, yesterday's argument, uh, we made quite a point about, um, they haven't even alleged this. Justice Ginsburg, uh, picking up on that point, turned to the union lawyer and said, look, you wanted a trial. Tell me what you would have proved at this trial, hoping, of course, that he would say, well, I would have proved that the union would have gone, uh, gone bankrupt without, without these agency fees. He couldn't go there, and he didn't go there, so he instead relied on an ad hominem attack on Rebecca. That was his answer. That's what they would have proved. <laughs> Justices were like, well, why does that matter to the constitutional rights of tens of thousands of people in the United States? The other reason they can't argue it is because we've had a 40-year pilot program on this. We don't, we've, we've put it to the test. 25 states say no agency fees, no compulsion of non-members to pay these fees. Uh, the federal government, even though Solicitor General Verrilli was on the other side, says we don't like agency fees either. Not one union anywhere has ever gone out of business because of the absence of agency fees. They're, they're doing just fine. So I think empir that empirical point came across quite uh, quite strongly at uh, yesterday's argument. Then the other justification for, okay, you can require uh, people like Rebecca to give money for collective bargaining because that, that just involves like money 
and that's prosaic. And who cares about you know money? That's not uh, speech about matters of public concern. So it's not the kind of thing you really value much in the marketplace of of ideas. And the amazing thing was. Uh, Justice Kagan had written that dissenting opinion in Harris, and nobody on the respondent side endorsed it. Um, the first question to the California Solicitor General was, doesn't this involve speech about important political matters? And he said, yes, it's all political. At which point, Chief Justice was so surprised, he's like, did you hear my question correctly? Because <laughs> <laughs> he didn't really say that, but he's like, I'm going to give you another chance to answer the question that just gave up this entire argument. And he basically uh, didn't. And um, it, was, it was the same thing with, with uh, the union's lawyers, et cetera. It really does defy reality to say when uh, Stockton, California, San Bernardino, California is going bankrupt because of the compensation you're playing, paying to public employees how you negotiate compensation for public employees. Pensions, health and welfare benefits and wages is not of profound interest to everybody in the community. Plus which, well, the things that Rebecca was talking about, about how you educate our kids at, are at the heart of collective bargaining agreements too. It's a, it's a very important matter, not just a fiscal policy, but education policy. Things like class size, they get to consult on curriculums, textbook, um, content of courses. Um, the whole educational reform debate, just pick a tub subject. How should you evaluate teachers? Should you use test scores? How, how, sh how easy should it be to discipline teachers? When we have to have a layoffs or assignments, should we use seniority or merit? Can I give a, a, f a physics teacher that I really need to teach my kids science a little bit more than the gym, the gym teacher, uh, which the unions won't let you do in order to attract uh, important students. It, you can literally identify every issue that's uh, divided people in the ongoing education reform debate, and every one of them is at the heart of a collective bargaining <coughs> agreement. So at the end of the day, I, I think we presented these arguments fully. I think uh, the merits of our case are just so overwhelming that I'm hopeful that, uh, uh, that we will prevail. And I don't think um, that the stare decisis argument holds much water. I'll just briefly say for two reasons. One is they've erroneously deprived Americans of a fundamental right. And, and as the court has made clear repeatedly, the citizen's right to a constitutional guarantee outweighs any kind of predictive or reliance interest that's involved in the policy of stare decisis, which means you know abiding by prior precedent. And Justice Breyer asked me a question. He said, well, what if we decided, uh, you know, he's talking about the Eighth Amendment and capital punishment. He's leaning towards the view that the death penalty is un unconstitutional. And I, I couldn't think of really a better hypothetical to make our point. If the court firmly concluded the capital punishment was unconstitutional, that the prior decisions upholding it were wrong, surely they wouldn't allow a state to continue to take human life through an unconstitutional procedure because of stare decisis, um, and, which seemed like a relatively telling point at the time. And, and then the other point, of course, and I won't bore you with the details, is Abood just can't be reconciled with any of the other court's cases in this, in this uh, context. So upholding Abood makes the law much more uh, unpredictable, inconsistent, and not even-handed, whereas if you eliminate that outlier, then the court's first amendment jurisprudence makes some sense. Thanks. James? Well, I'm not going to uh, hazard a guess at the, uh, the court's outcome uh, either, but uh, I'm going to just, uh, let's talk about what will happen if uh, Rebecca and uh, Mike uh, do in this case. I think the, the most significant consequence uh, at the level of the government employees themselves and the teachers is that they're going to see noticeably more accountability from their unions. This is something that receives very little attention, is that government unions in a state without right to work face very little meaningful accountability to the workers they purportedly represent. If you're a teacher like Rebecca or anyone else in uh, California, and you don't like the uh, policies your union's uh, putting in the contract, or you do like them, doesn't matter, you have to pay union dues. If you think the union's charging way too much and not providing enough value, or you think the union's spending uh, your dues very well, it doesn't matter. You have to pay. If you like the priorities the union's pushing for and just think they're doing a lousy job of pushing for them and not using their leverage properly, doesn't matter. You have to pay. 
know, in no other context in the U.S. economy does anyone argue that monopoly and being forced to purchase a, a service or a good from one and only one producer benefits the consumers. But we're seeing a lot of people arguing that these uh, compulsory union dues somehow benefit the workers themselves. And I think just the opposite is true. If you're a worker who doesn't like the good or service uh, you're getting uh, from your union, it doesn't matter. There's nothing you can do about it. Now, the unions will immediately respond with, yes, 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 of course we have to have these fees to protect against free riders. But look, these are democratically elected unions. The workers elect their union representatives, and then they elect their union officers. And this provides the accountability, and you know, don't worry about the, the forced dues. The problem is, is, OK, on paper, that's sort of true. But in the real world, it's nothing remotely close to being true. At a practical level, union members have no meaningful ability to influence uh, their unions through the elections. Uh, first take the, the election of the union representative. Rebecca was never asked to participate in the election which brought in her union. So you remember, it was there from when she was a student teacher. In fact, practically no one in the state of California who teaches participated in the elections that elected the California Teachers Association as their representatives. And that's because union representation is inherited. Once the union is formed, the union stays in office unless the workers petition for the equivalent of a recall vote, which is there's a lot of legal loopholes, or sorry, legal hoops you have to jump through to file for decertification. So for the most part, unions, you know, once they're formed, uh, Governor Brown in his uh, first go round uh, signed this law in 1975. Once they're formed, they stay in place, and the new workers simply inherit the unions their predecessors voted for. Now, this uh, chart and a few others I'll show is from a report we did in 2012, which basically shows what proportion of teachers have been on the job in different states for a given number of years. So 53% of Florida teachers have been in their school for more than 10 years. Well, you can see that once we get to about 40 years, nobody is left on the job. So these elections that all took place in the 60s and the 70s, you know, depending on the state, Michigan here, New York here, now, 40 plus years later, Basically, no one is left in those school districts who not even voted for the union, but had the opportunity to vote in the election, even if they voted no. No one's left. Uh, the United Federation of uh, Teachers organized New York City public schools in a vote in 1961. No one who participated in that election is still teaching in uh, the New York City public schools. But the union represents every teacher in the district to this day. Uh, this is uh, a chart from Florida where we found that in the 10 largest school districts, only 1% of the teachers had the opportunity to vote in the election uh, that brought in the, uh, uh, their unions. In Michigan, in eight of the 10 largest school districts, as of 2012, no one was left. Uh, two of those districts organized in the early 80s, and there's about 10% left. Across the, the overall districts, 99% of the teachers never participated or had the opportunity to participate in the elections that brought in the, uh, the unions. And so I think calling these democratically elected unions is pretty strange. I mean, if Scott Brown had been elected in that uh, special election in Massachusetts, and then he just got to represent Massachusetts you know, until the rest of his life, you know, I, I don't think uh, very many uh, you know, voters in Massachusetts would consider that terribly democratic, uh, especially everyone who uh, you know, came of voting age uh, after that election and moved to the state afterwards. But that's what teachers are stuck with. You, know, you uh, in New York, maybe you'd like the NEA rather than the uh, uh, UFT in New York City. Doesn't matter. You know, the UFT came in, and, and that's that. <coughs> Now, the, the next argument that will be made, though, is that, well, you can elect your union officers, and that, that therefore provides some accountability to the unions. And at, at one level, this is true. The union officers are democratically elected. But the overwhelming advantage in this, in these campaigns go to the incumbent officers, because the, uh, the union locals will spend multiple different work sites, multiple different campuses. And so it's not just enough for Rebecca to have to persuade her coworkers that, uh, you know, whoever it is, if she were trying to uh, you know, win election to the, uh, the, uh, the local presidency. But she has to persuade teachers she's never met all across the local. Uh, whereas the union president, all the union communications, always you know, message from your president, such and such in the newsletter, they've got the name ID. It would be like trying to run for Congress when effectively you couldn't run any uh, TV or radio ads or, uh, or newsprint ads. In theory, if the voters don't like their incumbent enough, they can vote them out, but it's going to be awful hard. Uh, and that's what we see at the, at the local level. It does happen. Uh, Karen Lewis famously uh, uh, kicked out the leadership in the Chicago Teachers Union a few years ago. But it's hard. But the next problem is, even if you win at the local level, that's not where most of the money is being spent. 
most of the money and the policies are being decided uh, at either the statewide level, the California Teachers Association, or the, the national level, the National Association. That's where, based on the union, 60 to 80 percent of the dues ultimately get spent. Now, those unions, most uh, of these unions, not all, but most of them, are structured with an indirect officer election mm -hmm. structure. So uh, the, uh, the current executive director of the CTA never had to stand for election before the rank and file. Rebecca and her fellow teachers never got to vote yes or no on this guy. Rather, you have 760 uh, uh, low-profile delegate elections to the State Council of Education. And they're very low-profile. It's predominantly filled by union activists. And it's that State Council of Education that then elects the, uh, the union board. Uh, there was a paper uh, or in, uh, a journal article in the American Economic Review about two or three years ago which went through and demonstrated how unions with these indirect officer elections are actually much more successful than unions with directly elected you know, statewide or national <coughs> officers. Why? Because these unions uh, basically don't have to pay attention to the needs of the rank and file. That by having this you know, a secondary body made up primarily of union activists uh, allows the, uh, the union high command to basically pay attention only to the most committed union activists and ignore the views of the rank and file. And they go through and demonstrate how basically uh, unions like this are more successful institutionally precisely because they can ignore the, the, the interests of the rank and file and do what benefits the union as an organization. And so if you take a look at uh, the tenure of various uh, union officers in these major government unions, it's like the Soviet Politburo. I mean, these people basically, they get to stay in office for the most part as long as they want, and then they retire, and you know, their chosen successor replaces them. Uh, this is the history of uh, SEIU uh, union uh, presidents uh, going back to 1940. There was one guy in the, the mid-90s who uh, was so unfortunate he only had a one-year term. Uh, but then besides uh, him and the, you know, the current president, uh, who's been in place since 2010, everyone else got to serve at least nine years. And many of them, uh, John Sweeney got to serve 15 years, Andy Stern was there 14 years. It is not as though Andy Stern was kicked out. He just decided he wanted to retire and do other things. And then Mary Kay Henry came in, not by vote of the union membership, but by mo uh, vote of the, the leadership of the major SEIU locals. Let's look at AFSCME, American Federation of State County Municipal Employees. Well, they make the SEIU look uh, downright democratic. Uh, since, the, uh, since 1936, they've had uh, three, uh, three leaders, uh, except they just got a new president uh, last year. And the shortest any of those leaders stayed in office was 17 years. Now, maybe just AFSCME has just done an amazing job of representing their workers. <laughs> or maybe it's a very difficult uh, system for uh, rank and file workers who are dissatisfied with the union to ever express that displeasure in a way that would cost the union <coughs> leadership their jobs. Let's look at Rebecca's union, the CTA here. Uh, they're, uh, they just have a new executive director, uh, but then the previous two both served for uh, 18 and 19 years. Why? Well, you've got a system and a structure in which the views of the rank and file have almost no ability to translate into changing the union leadership. Mm -hmm. So, well, on paper, unions are these democratic organizations. At the practical level, these workers who are forced to pay union dues have no means of changing the policies of the union. As Rebecca found, being part of her union's executive board, she couldn't get them to change the preference for uh, uh, layoffs uh, in, uh, in lieu of, uh, of pay cuts. And so this is... Uh, the, the arguments that uh, unions are all accountable to the members, I think, are rather rich. And this is actually something that uh, union presidents uh, themselves uh, uh, will recognize. Uh, this is a quote from a Washington Post article by uh, Lydia DePillis. Uh, it's a very well-written article that I, I'd recommend uh, everyone should read, uh, where uh, this was written right after the Supreme Court announced they're going to hear Friedrichs. And uh, what's happened is uh, AFSCME and the, the other major government unions have seen this coming down the pipe, have been afraid of losing this case, and had begun a massive outreach campaign to their, their members. And the article primarily focuses on the outreach campaign, how the union is trying to persuade them that these are services worth, worth paying for, showing them all the services the union's providing that they might not be aware of, that they can take advantage of, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And basically, you know, dues become voluntary, would like you to still pay. And the question I had when I read that is, why weren't you doing this before? And uh, this is actually a, a question that, uh, uh, that the uh, reporter asked uh, Lee Saunders, who's the president of AFSCME. And we have up here a direct quote from the article. Why hadn't they done this before? I think we took things for granted. We stopped communicating with people because we didn't feel like we needed to. That is the system that most union members are in today. That if the court rules against Rebecca and against the plaintiffs, they're going to be forced to pay union dues that are typically $700 to $1,000 a year, they have no meaningful ability to change the union leadership or the union policies, 
and the union doesn't even feel the need to communicate with them because the workers have to pay anyway. And uh, I'll briefly go through this, uh, not to try and uh, suck up too much time, but uh, Frank Luntz did a poll of about 900 uh, private and government union members uh, in 2010. And what he found here is pretty a uh, high number of uh, union members, 41% of the government, disapprove of the job the union leaders are doing. 63% uh, want their union to be held more accountable to the, uh, the workers they represent. 64% think that the union leaders look, prim uh, look out primarily for themselves and not for the little guy and the rank and file they're supposed to represent. 59% think uh, that they uh, pay too much in dues for the value they're getting from the union. And 80% believe that uh, you should not be forced to be fired uh, if you uh, 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 are a government employee, that you should not uh, have to pay union dues on, on pain of losing your job. 80% of government union members. I mean, all the press and coverage you're hearing is how the unions are so concerned about this, uh, unions are worried. No, 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 the union executives are worried. The union members themselves are very supportive of the notion that the union should be more accountable to them and they should have a, a, a choice in paying union dues. And that's exactly what's going to happen if, uh, if Rebecca and her fellow plaintiffs win this case. The union, for the first time in many of these states, first time in California certainly, is going to have to persuade the workers that their services are worth paying for. They will have to persuade the workers that they are wise stewards of their money, that they are actually rep representing the positions of the rank and file in, in bargaining negotiations, uh, that uh, the union is uh, pursuing their interests as aggressively as it could, and they will have to earn the members' dues. So I think they're going to lose some members, but they're not going to lose as many uh, members as uh, some of the, uh, uh, the doomsday predictions suggest, precisely because the unions are going to change how they represent workers to make them more attractive. We're already seeing it happen. The threat of voluntary dues has caused every major government union to engage in a massive outreach campaign with their members uh, to try and represent them more effectively and learn their views. Uh, I think that uh, that shows exactly what the effect is going to be if uh, Rebecca wins. But I will add with a, a final coda is that the unions don't welcome this accountability, and they're going to make it as, as difficult as possible to, uh, to work. You, you may not be able to read this uh, projected from out here. It's in fine print. Uh, just keep in mind that the actual physical card they were handing, uh, this is an SEIU card. Uh, and what happened was SEIU lost a previous case in 2014 uh, that said that for home care workers, which are predominantly uh, family members and parents taking care of disabled children, uh, they get a Medi Medicaid reimbursement check. And in about uh, 18, 20 states, the unions have got these uh, workers classified as government employees and were taking about $400 a year in dues out of their checks. And the, uh, the court said, no, 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 these guys aren't government workers. This is a free speech issue. Similar uh, uh, arguments to those that were raised uh, uh, yesterday. And the, the court ruled that you can't do this, and they're now voluntary. But in between the oral arguments, which went very badly for the union, and the, the court handing down its ruling, uh, the SEU started going to their members in California, and or sorry, to the, the parents and the family members uh, in the home care program, and handing them these membership cards and giving them a whole pitch about how the union's working hard for you, and look, if you've got to pay these dues, you might as well sign on to become a full member, and you know, we're, we're standing together to, to say that home care work is very difficult, and we want to show that there's dignity to this work. We know this because the, uh, the parents of uh, a, uh, an intern here at the Heritage Foundation at that time, uh, you know, uh, his mother was one of these home care workers taking care of uh, one of his siblings. And she had the union come to her door and give her this you know, wonderful pitch and lets you stand together for the dignity of workers. But if you read in the, the fine print uh, of this, uh, this card, uh, you see that you're committing to uh, make the uh, SEIU, yes, you're, you're a member, and you're committing to an irrevocable uh, membership in the SEIU which can only be revoked uh, in a 10-day window uh, every year on the anniversary of your signing this card. Now, that was certainly not something that they were telling her or explaining to her. And they certainly weren't telling her that the uh, Supreme Court was soon going to make the, the entirety of these $400 a year in dues voluntary. And yet, had she signed onto this card and then subsequently learned that it was optional and uh, sent in a, a membership opt-out form, the union would have sent it back to her and said, nope, this is not in your 10-day window. And they would have been under no obligation to hold that for 10 days. We, we saw this in, uh, in Michigan, where the Michigan Education Association uh, would uh, decide that August was the only month you could opt out of membership in the union after the state passed right to work. And so teachers were sending in their opt-out forms in, uh, in May or in, in July, and would get a letter in September saying, oops, August was the month you were supposed to opt out, and you didn't do it. Wait till next year. Uh, fortunately, the uh, it's a, uh, Republican Governor uh, Rick Snyder has appointed a majority on the uh, Michigan Employment Relations Commission, and they basically cracked down on this. No, 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 guys, that's not what the law says. 
but in more liberal states like California, like Washington State, I, I imagine that there's going to be a degree of accountability, but there's also going to be a degree of games like this where the unions are going to make it as hard as possible for anyone who signed up as a member under the previous regime or under their outreach campaigns to then rescind that authorization if they decide they don't like the services being offered. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Pat to discuss uh, how many workers he thinks uh, are actually going to take advantage of this uh, option. Um, yesterday's oral argument was really, I think, a um, culmination of a, a giant union backfire. And that backfire was their attempt to extend a boot in the first place. Um, in 2009, there was a case called Locke v. Karras in which no member of the United States Supreme Court questioned the concept of agency fees. It was a question of whether or not these fees were or were not chargeable. Um, right before that, a couple of years before that, the union started doing these daycare and home health care unionizations. They were taking over private businesses of, of private daycares, and because these people were receiving government subsidies, they were saying, some of the clients of these people were receiving government subsidies, they were saying, well, really, the government could be doing this work, so therefore you're kind of a government worker, and therefore can be unionized under a boot. Um, we challenged this in Michigan on state law grounds, eventually got people to, to take it back. It had gone on in 14 or 15 states. Uh, it had gone on out in California, and uh, after California did it in 1999, then it was done by a ballot initiative in Oregon, uh, constitutional amendment if I remember correctly, then done by a ballot initiative in, in Washington. Uh, Illinois tried this after having failed, this, this whole unionization concept had failed in, in Illinois in the 1980s. And uh, then Governor Blagojevich, at the uh, behest of the SEIU, decided that, well, a judicial decision to the contrary was really no obstacle. And he did an executive order just saying that they could go ahead and do this. Um, the legislature eventually codified it, still against a judicial decision. And that led right to work uh, to file one of their cases, which became Harris v. Quinn. Now, between Locke v. Karras and uh, the, the, these things started becoming publicized, people started to be aware that this whole abode expansion was going on. And it was be going on because the unions were losing private sector people slowly. And they were trying to find some way to get their public sector numbers up. Their public sector had been very steady. It's at about 35 percent of, of the workforce. It stayed there. But they needed and they recognized that they were slowly still just losing a little bit of private sector here, a little bit there each year, and they were down to, I believe it was around 7% uh, in, in 2014 or 2015. So Harris v. Quinn goes up to the United States Supreme Court. And um, in the interim, we've had the Knox decision. And the Supreme Court, out of uh, surprising to many of us, said, wait a minute, Abood's kind of on shaky ground. And, and just three or four years earlier, they had they hadn't discussed it. So we think that there's some possibility that the pub publicity surrounding this expansion is, is what got the court to, 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 take, to take another look. So um, with Harris, there was a question of whether or not Abood was or was not going to be decided by the court because the case had already started to be litigated before Knox had come out. And so there were a lot of people uh, debating as to whether or not the court was really going to take this step or not at, at oral argument. It was still somewhat of a question. So we get to oral argument, and the court is, is indicating that it's at least considering um, overturning a boot instead of just saying that whatever you're doing here, this is one step too far. These people, uh, they eventually decided these people just aren't government employees. We're not going to decide the question of a, on, on a boot right now. However, um, Justice Kagan, in, in, uh, who wrote the dissent, and Justice Alito hashed out Abood at length. And it was a five to four decision, and everybody put into their, um, into the opinions, there's their relative strengths and relative weaknesses of what they thought was going on with Abood. And one of the things that Kagan said, uh, Justice Kagan said, that was interesting is uh, this. She said, does the majority think that public employees are immune from basic principles of economics? If not, the majority can have no basis for thinking that absent a fair share clause, a union can attract sufficient dues to adequately support its functions. Essentially, she was arguing that without agency fees, that there will be no exclusive representation. And that's the purported state interest. That's the interest that's supposed to allow the state to overcome Rebecca and other people like her's First Amendment rights. 
So her argument was, without this, that eventually all unions will will go bankrupt because there will be free riding that everyone will not want to pay for these so-called services that the union provides. Well, intuitively, that has to be wrong. And the reason we know that has to be wrong is that as of 1947, we've had right to work in the private sector. And about, at, uh, about half of the states are right to work in this country. And yet there are still unions in these states. So the, the concept that you can have, that you must have agency fees to have an exclusive representation has to be wrong. But the, um, in Harris, the... Um, the two sides pointed to the federal workforce, and, and Justice Kagan was saying, well, look, look at what their numbers are. They're down in the 30 percent of people that are covered, or 35 percent of people that are covered by, by these collective bargaining agreements are full union members. Clearly, the unions are going to be losing. It'll be a, a horrendous thing for the unions if this goes through. They'll lose members hand over fist. This will destroy public sector unionism in its entirety, and this entire parade of horribles. So what was interesting is that in many ways the court set the parameters of what the debate was going to be in the Friedrichs case. I mean, we got a dry run as to what needed to be shown and why. It was, um, you know, they, they had clearly set out their positions. There were some questions amongst whether or not there were five votes here or five votes there. And so we started looking at ways of trying to prove uh, in our amicus brief that, um, that exactly what we said, that there are people in right-to-work states, and therefore we know that this, this can't be true. So we had to figure out a way to do it. And the way we came up with is that we uh, pulled up the current population surveys. And if you all have done anything regarding unemployment or, or union uh, membership rates, there, these are the 60,000-person surveys that the government continually runs. And they've been running them since the early 80s. Now, Boot itself was decided in 1977 before these surveys really became commonplace. But what they do tell you is, is that they tell you who has jobs, if they're in a union, and if they're covered by a collective bargaining agreement. And so what we figured is, is that we could take these numbers and that we could um, determine what the difference is in agency fee states where right to work um, is, is not allowed, where people have to pay these, these same agency fees that Rebecca <coughs> is, and in states in uh, right to work where there is no threat of being fired for, for not subsidizing somebody whose speech you disagree with. And what we did was we were able to uh, put that up on a graph. And James, can I have you help me find yeah, we'll, uh, that? It's right here. Down. Okay. And so what we did was this, this um, the first brief set of briefs we did is we did this in the private sector because they're just easier, um, they're, they're easier to have exclusive representation, and we knew that all of the laws was the same. Under the NLRA, it's a national law. And everybody's situation is the same, and 14B uh, allows states to enact right to work. And what we did is we, we segregated the states into three separate groups. Um, agency fee states are this uh, blue line, uh, light blue line. Uh, right to work states were the yellow line, and what we called mixed status states were states like Indiana, Wisconsin, and Michigan that had transferred over time. And what we found was this. Um, in these uh, agency fee states, about 93% of people covered by a union contract were full members. Okay? And in states where you had the uh, right to work opportunities, that number dropped, but it only dropped to about 82%. And you'll note that this, is, uh, this graph is over a 15 year period from 2000 to 2014. So the, the idea that Justice Kagan and the dissenters had <coughs> that uh, union membership was necessarily going to nosedive and that all unions will be driven into the ground uh, just clearly couldn't be the case. Now, for the, the, that was something that we submitted on the uh, cert stage brief, but we added an extra line on the uh, uh, merits brief, and what we did is we pulled eight states that have uh, mandatory exclusive, it's, it's still here, it's, it's that okay. same, um, that have mandatory bargaining and, uh, but, but have right to work. And these eight states uh, were Florida, Idaho, uh, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, Nevada, North Dakota, and South Dakota. And they're represented by this purple line. And so if the Supreme Court rules the way we want in Friedrichs, we're essentially going to end up at, at this purple line area because all states will have exclusive, that if they want to have exclusive representation, fine, but they'll all be in a right to work environment. And so what is the union membership percentage there? Lo and behold, it's about the same 80%.
Now, uh, after filing this brief, we actually did some more research, and, and in the Beck cases where the private sector, uh, this whole concept of not paying for private sector um, uh, politics comes in, and I re was reminded of something that I had forgotten, and that was uh, in the 1950s, the Railway Labor Act transferred over. <laughs> And it used to be entirely voluntary. In other words, people only paid if they felt that they were getting a, uh, a service, a value out of the service, and they didn't, um, they didn't pay otherwise. And what was that percentage that they did, and this was a congressional finding in, in the 1950s? It was exactly at 80%. So it is fairly clear that if this if the court is to rule in Rebecca's favor that the, the concept that the unions are, are going to be driven into the ground, uh, Justice Kagan's point, uh, just doesn't hold water. And as a matter of fact, you saw uh, the Solicitor General Verrilli kind of run away from that at oral argument. Uh, amongst the three people who uh, presented arguments on the respondent's side, well, one of his main three points was, exactly what we're saying here is is you just it can't be right the Kagan's argument has to be incorrect because we've had um, right to work for 70 years and we have unions in right to work states uh, and once that justification falls apart they, the unions really are left with nothing to argue um, there is no the state interest again is supposed to be that you have to have a uh, exclusive bargaining partner. Well, if you have an entity that's going to get around 80% of the people covered by the collective bargaining agreement, there is absolutely no threat at all that unions are going to run away and die. And therefore, this it really does, I think, undercut the argument that was placed for us. Remember, this was the argument placed for us by the dissenters as to why a boot was necessary. So I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, this graph will show up in U.S. Uh, reports here, but, but we'll see if that's the case. Um, as James was saying, there is some stuff going on in Michigan. Uh, if Friedrichs comes around, there is going to be some more, some more work. Um, there are tens of thousands of contracts out there, how the court's going to treat them, what, how the unions are going to fight back. I think you saw Justice Sotomayor kind of trying to set the groundwork for, okay, well, why don't we just do direct cash payments to the unions and we'll get them the money that they want anyway. So I think that um, while this is going to be a watershed and important case, and I'll join everyone in, in uh, not making a prediction, although I really was feeling good after all argument, um, <laughs> that we're going to have our work cut out for us still. This is a, a group that for 30 or 40 years has been willing to suppress the speech and, and force people to come along and say things that they don't want to say. I, I don't expect that they're going to give up no matter how Friedrichs turns out. Thank you, Patrick. Now we have time for uh, a few questions from the audience. We have a couple ground rules. Please wait for the microphone, identify yourself, and ask a question. Don't give a speech. <laughs> start here. Of the members approving to be recertified as the bargaining agent, the, the public employees unions did. I mentioned that because I'm curious. At this point, could the CTA get 51% of its members to recertify? Is that a question for me? Well, <laughs> well I'll just uh, chime in with the Wisconsin experience. So Wisconsin and Tennessee are the two states that have government unions. Uh, but have required them to stand for re-election periodically. Uh, both those laws passed in 2011. And uh, what we've seen in Wisconsin is about 80% of the government unions got re-elected. Uh, obviously, that leaves about 20% that, uh, that did not. And those were the elections that actually went to, uh, to a vote. There were some cases where the union just knew they didn't have support and, and didn't really bother contesting it. But uh, in Wisconsin, we've seen about 20% uh, of the teachers uh, voted against uh, retaining the representatives. I couldn't find statistics uh, for, uh, for Tennessee's so that they don't appear to be centrally published anywhere on the, uh, the state websites. Uh, but I, I imagine you'd probably see, you know, e in a uh, union re-election <laughs> world, most of the unions get re-elected, but uh, you know, a minority of them would get decertified. There is, there's a wild card in, in Wisconsin, and it, it kind of goes to Kagan's point about the federal, uh, federal numbers as well. Um, one of the things that was done with Act 10 was that they limited the scope of bargaining. 
and therefore um, the wage increases are really all that can be bargained over and those are capped at CPI or 3%, whichever is less. And in the federal system, uh, you can't argue about, you can't ask for wages entirely. Essentially, the federal government, you bargain about parking spots. Um, so there is a reason why those numbers were so low. And Justice Kagan was trying to, to use those incorrectly, I think, as showing that they're what would happen to unions without agency fees. Really, if you limit the scope of bargaining and you make the unions and you handcuff them so sufficiently that they can't bargain over anything, I think a lot of people recognize at that point, well, why am I giving them $1,000? Other questions? Um, in here, in the back? Hi, Olivia DePillis, Washington Post. Um, so there's some arguments circulating on the left about what should happen if the Supreme Court does rule against the unions, um, one of which is that uh, if exclusive representation remains but agency fees are no longer allowed, that uh, unions should no longer be required to represent all people in the bargaining unit. Um, do you think that is a viable legal strategy? Uh I think it's along California now. Um, there's religious objectors. One of our plaintiffs is a religious objector. And uh, like Rebecca could basically withhold $400. Um, religious objectors, for some odd reason, um, they, on the one hand, quite correctly allow them to withhold the $1,000 to go to the union, and then they make them give $1,000 to a charity. And in the statute authorizing them to do that, it says, if one of these objectors comes to a union and says, I'd like a, a, a grievance representation, then they can charge the religious objector a reasonable cost. So I don't really even think today in California there's any requirement that you represent uh, people who don't pay agency fees um, uh, a duty of fair representation. Each state can craft its own law and however it uh, finds this equitable. I'll make two additional points. One is this grievance thing is just a frolic and a detour. They don't spend any money uh, representing uh, non-members that they don't want to represent. They have unfettered discretion to not represent them if they don't do it. The only time a non-member even might get swept up into the grievance representation is if it's such a clear violation that it's going to affect members, the unions will go ahead. But it's totally up to them on, on whether or not to do grievance representation in the first place. And then second of all, of course, they don't in any way listen to the non-members at all about the nuts and bolts of what they're doing, which is the positions they're taking in collective bargaining. They don't give them a whit of concern. So this notion that they've got some duty to non-members is a passingly strange duty, because if they do have a duty, they violate it on a daily basis. <laughs> I, I'd just add uh, one thing briefly. The, uh, the report I had uh, earlier, uh, we called for uh, two things in that report. One would be either union re-election votes, uh, but uh, what I think would make a lot more sense would be just members-only unions. Uh, the unions would represent the workers who want the union membership, and the non-members, if they don't, if you're a new hire, uh, like the uh, fourth grade teachers in uh, Rebecca's district, and you don't want seniority-based layoffs, let them negotiate separately for performance-based. And so I, I think the notion of non-exclusive representation makes a lot of sense. Unions don't want it. Uh, in Michigan, the, uh, you, you had the uh, head of, I think it was the Michigan Education Association, was complaining about free riders in a hearing on right to work. And one of the legislators, uh, legislators asked him, uh, so are you saying you'd like us to relieve you of uh, exclusive <laughs> representation? And he immediately said, no, 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 we don't want that. Uh, in Kansas, you, you had a, a very similar proposal in 2011 that, uh, that went through uh, that was being proposed in the State House of Representatives that would have basically had members-only unions. You'd have one union in the district, uh, but that you know, if you had, say, 20% who didn't want it, they could negotiate for themselves. And the Kansas uh, NEA just went ballistic, and this is an attack on collective bargaining, this is horrid. Kansas is a right-to-work state. So you know, when they were offered the prospect of not representing the non-members, they were furious at that because it gives them less leverage. I mean, the, if you want to have a workable seniority system, you have to force the workers your you know, hosing, basically, into the seniority system. Letting them opt out and negotiating their own contract makes the whole thing break down. Uh, so while they will complain about free writing, every time they've been offered to get out from under it, they've uh, declined the invitation. We have time for one more question. Thank you, Dan Kelly, a tourist. Um, there, you gave a chart a few minutes ago where it showed certain unions with um, 
states which had like 80% of mm -hmm. the right to work states and other states. Yes. And they had Michigan and Wisconsin, which went from. Um, Agency fee to right to work. Yes. How, has, how do the unions behavior towards their members vary given the, by the state laws and particularly concentrated on Michigan and Wisconsin where the, the laws was changed. Did you see a change in the conduct of the union towards their members? And yeah, it, it's anecdotal, but um, I, um, we have been dealing with this, this so-called August window in Michigan. I've done a lot of litigation with it. Uh, right to Works here, they've done a fair amount of litigation with it as well. We actually have the uh, August window overturned right now, but uh, we've been dealing with the way the union's treating their members at first. Uh, they were quite hostile to anybody who thought about it. Um, you're seeing some anecdotal evidence of some locals and some people trying to, to recognize that they're, they have a lot less power now over these people and that they have to make them satisfied and do a better job. And this is James's point. Um, if you have a membership that is not obligated to pay you, if you do a lousy job, you're not going to get their money. And um, there's just, the incentives are pretty clear. Uh, represent your people or don't get paid. And I, I, think, that's a, I think that's a benefit for, the, for them. Uh, they may not see it as such right now, but it will be in the long term. With that, we've come to the end of our time. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Yeah.